John saw them uh, standing on the four corners of the earth. Now, maybe that's where the Flat Earth Society got its idea that the earth was flat. I don't know. But the, the scripture here says the four corners of the earth. And the scripture only means that each of these angels contained one of the winds from one of the directions of the earth. So either north, south, east, or west. And what ha is happening here is God has given them power over the climate and the weather conditions and patterns over the whole earth. Every fall, we begin to hear about El Nino. I haven't heard it so far this year, but generally they start talking about it this time of the year. And it's caused by the shifting of the jet stream over the oceans. And depending on the change of the direction of the jet stream, we could have warmer or colder or wetter or more snow or less snow during our winter period. So often we don't really stop to consider the power of wind. Wind can be either a great friend or a terrible enemy. Uh, the, the, uh, in scripture, wind played a big part in the judgments that God brought upon the earth. In Genesis chapter 41 and verse 6, the seven years of the Egyptian famine were brought about by a strong east wind that God brought on the land as part of the judgment. The plague of locusts uh, came upon Egypt through an east wind as well in Exodus chapter 30 and verse chapter, yeah. chapter 10. And verse 13. The same east wind allowed the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea. Remember how they were trapped along the shore? And a strong east wind came and removed the or part of the water so that they could go through. So the east wind is often associated with God's judgment and his delivering power. So we've seen some of the devastation that wind can cause it if anybody was around in 1987 and saw the tornado that ripped through the city of Edmonton, your eyes were quickly opened as to the power of wind when it gets out of control. Lately in the southern states, the tornadoes that are there are getting more and more intense. They've had winds of up to 200 miles an hour in some of these uh, tornadoes that come with them through. And the hurricanes that struck not so long ago in, in uh, Louisiana, that nearly wiped out the city of uh, Baton Rouge, there, that was a monumental hurricane with winds and uh, waves really high, unusual, and getting stronger. So here, uh, in, this, in this chapter, these angels have the power to destroy or refresh the earth by using wind. In the book of Daniel, now chapter 7, verse 2, the Bible says it was the four winds that blew that stirred up the great sea. And when the sea was stirred up by these winds, Four beasts were seen coming out of the troubled waters. So the sea represented the Gentile nations from which the four successive world empires would arise. The same four winds control the uh, upcoming of the Antichrist in judgment on Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. In the Bible, the wind that whips up the waves signifies unrest among people. So whenever people are at unrest like they are now in the, in the European area, we have all of the movement of the masses to different countries. That's unrest fomenting among people. And a lot of that is going to be due to the, the fact that God is stirring up, the winds are blowing, and people are getting stirred up. And of course, the Bible tells us that the Antichrist himself will rise out of the tumult of people where there's great unrest and great perplexity. And I was just uh, reading the other day how the German nation is now looking for a person with really strong leadership uh, capabilities to handle all of the new influx of immigrants that they're going to allow into their country. They're talking about something like 200,000 new citizens coming in. All of them, most of them of Muslim faith. But you know, in that group that's coming over, there are a great number of Christians as well that are fleeing the persecution from the Middle East. So, when we move on through Bible prophecy, we go through the book, the rest of the book of Revelation. We're going to see that the wind creates the circumstances that allow people and kingdoms to come into prominence. He stirs, the Bible says God builds up one nation and tears down another, sets up one government and takes out another. So these winds then that, are, that these angels control uh, speak of impending global judgments and their initiation and their uh, sovereign control by God himself. So what God is saying here when he says to these angels, don't blow anymore on the, on the face of the earth, he's ceasing some activity. From now on, there's going to be peace among the people on the face of the earth for a short period of time. Now, this may well represent the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation where everybody's crying peace and safety 
and all these things are running along fairly smoothly. But as we know, the Bible says that after the third three and a half years, the Antichrist breaks the covenant, and then all of the bad things start to really manifest themselves. So these winds are symbolism here, and is to remind us that everything is under God's control. We don't need to fear anything on the face of the earth as Christians if we have to put our trust and our faith in Him. Right? Amen. We can go to sleep at night and not worry about anything because God, the God that controls the winds and the forces of nature is on our side. Amen. So as Christians, we can look at that and say, hey, this is a promise for us here that when things get really difficult in our life, God can withhold the winds of oppression or trouble or difficulty in our lives by a simple word. So he can start or stop the winds any time he chooses. So sometimes if I need correction, God can send a little breeze into my life that's going to stir me up and make me look at my life and say, Lord, I'm in the wrong spot here. Because it's a warning sign to her, and it's also a warning sign to me if that happens in my life. Mm-hmm. So when the angel commands not to blow on the earth, or the sea, or of any tree, we are to understand that this is a temporary pause in troubles on the face of the earth. That's right. These three parts of the creative order, the, the, the uh, trees, the sea and the earth will undergo further judgment later on. But for right now, God is giving us a respite. There's going to be an opportunity here of quietness. And he's doing it for a reason. The scriptures tell us that, right? So this may well be then the first three and a half years of tribulation where God is going to start sealing his servants. So the God that, that uh, uh, caused the angels to stop blowing on the wind is giving mankind another opportunity to consider his path. All of these calamities that have been falling on the earth will make people stop and think, what is going on? Is our earth going to destroy itself? And they'll begin to realize after these things become more and more serious. The Bible says later on that they hid in the rocks and the caves because they uh, were afraid of the face of him who sits on the throne, which means they understood now that these judgments were coming from God. They're not just natural things that happen. There's a supernatural force behind them. You're saying that this is kind of the pause before the storm. Yeah, right. Uh, I think I mentioned a bit earlier that what we're seeing on the face of the earth today are just harbingers of what will come in more intensity later on. As man grows more and more wicked and more and more distant from God, the judgment of God will become stronger and stronger across the face of the earth, and we'll see earthquakes of unimaginable uh, intensity and winds that are super winds and all these different things. They're talking now about all these different uh, uh, factors that are playing into the into the intensity of the storms that are coming on the face of the earth. So, this time, because God is doing this, He's using this time, and God is a very good operator of time. He doesn't waste any motion. While He's got these angels tied up not to blow anymore, and there's peace on the earth, He's going to have His 144,000 chosen servants sealed in their forehead. So, that when, what's going to happen here, and most people believe this to be true, that the, these will be Jewish, Jewish uh, Judaists who were not Christian, but who through the things that they saw coming on the face of the earth, recognized from Scripture that this is a supernatural event. And they'll begin to investigate the Torah and, and the Bible and find out that Jesus, the Messiah, was missed by the nation. And then they will turn, and the Bible says, then that God will seal them in their forehead. So there's a, there's a great deal to be said about sealing We'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, in a few moments here. So chapter 5 teaches us that seals are an authorizing item of a document, right? When you have a, a document that is sealed, it's authorized by the owner or the controller of the contract. So when these 144,000 are sealed, they're authorized to become the spokesman for God on the earth. So he's going to give them supernatural power to be able to fight against the forces of the enemy and to harvest thousands and millions of souls out of the face of the earth. That's the grace of God. Mm-hmm. Because he did not have to do that. At the rapture of the church, he could have said, that's it, everybody else dies. But he didn't do that. God's heart is to save every soul on the face of this earth. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. So he uses 144,000 of the Jewish people to come and to evangelize in great power and with signs and wonders across the face of the earth. So they're authorized to use the power of God. When they're sealed, then they also receive the protection by the sealer, which is God. So the people will not be able to resist the wisdom and the power and the, the 
the evangelistic ability that they have, millions will be swept into the kingdom of God, who will have to die for their faith when we read a little bit further here. Now, in ancient Rome, government used to mark their soldiers with uh, marks on their hands, and the slaves received marks on their hands. So sealing of, of your property was not an uncommon thing. So the slave was easily identified. These guys will not be able to hide on the face of the earth. They will have a mark on them that will identify them as the servants of God to everybody that passes by. So you can imagine that the forces of the enemy and the unbelievers, I mean, look at the world today. If you say anything good about Jesus, they're all over you. And they're criticizing you and every other thing you can imagine. Well, these guys are going to be fortified by God to be able to take that kind of abuse and rejection and not be disheartened or depressed by it or anything else. God is going to give them supernatural power to be able to minister his word in, a, in, a, in the midst of a generation that uh, doesn't want it. And you know, that's God's witness. No one will ever be able to say that God did not give everybody a fair chance at salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of this here. This 144,000 is God's last attempt to people to say, listen, you've seen what I'm doing here. Get right. This was my son. You rejected him. And people will, some of them, begin to respond to that. So the mark here is visible and it allows, it allows for easy identification of these 144,000. And it's not clear yet who can see the mark. We'll just take a moment of that later on. As unpopular as it seems to be, the Bible says that everyone will receive a mark. Whether we're Christians or whether we are forces of the enemy, there will be a divine who goes on. And so we will be sealed in our forehead as well with the visible mark that we belong to Almighty God. Whereas the forces of the enemy will be marked that they belong to the devil. It's going to be that clear uh, black and white line between the righteous and the unrighteous. There'll be no mistake uh, who goes where. So when we get saved, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. While we live on this planet, we uh, what we do displays whether or not we really have been sealed by God. Amen. And their revelation is going to be what they're doing. They're going to make a change across the face of the earth. And people are going to have to say, these are servants of the living God. Look at what's happening. You remember what they said about Jesus? No man could do the things that you're doing except God is doing. That same attitude is going to come. People are going to realize that there's going to be a difference here. There's going to be either a clear rejection of the message of God, or there's going to be an acceptance. There'll be a, a divine line so sharp that God can be vindicated when he judges no one will be able to say that God judged unjustly any person on the face of the earth. So, when the 144,000 are sealed, it marks a change in the dispensation of grace. When the 144,000 are sealed, it indicates that the times of the Gentiles are fully fulfilled, and God is now going to return to Israel, the center of his plan. So evangelism will no longer come from the Gentiles, it will now come from the Jews. This is God's plan. So you can see that the days of grace are gone from the Gentile nation. It's now the Jews who are going to administer the power of God and preach the word. So these 12 tribes of Israel, as Leora read earlier, there's a mystery among these 12 tribes. Does anybody know what it is? Why did he substitute Manasseh for Dan? Yes. Dan is left off of the list, which is surprising. There's Joseph actually two tribes. Manasseh yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, Dan has been left out, and Ephraim, his brothers, uh, sorry, Dan has been left out, Manasseh has been included, Ephraim, his brother, uh, the brother of Manasseh has been left out, and Levi has been added. But Levi was not really a land-owning tribe, and there's a reason why his name is on this list as well. Why, is, why are those names left off? Well, Dan, the tribe of Dan, was left off because he was the, his tribe was the tribe that led Israel into idolatry in great amounts, a whole nation. When they captured the city of Laish, they renamed it Dan and they set up an idol in there. And you remember the story of uh, Micah who had the 1,100 shekels and he, he yielded his mother and he got the silver back from her and he made an idol out of it. It was the tribe of Dan that came and took him and that idol and set the thing up and led the whole nation into idolatry. So in the, uh, in the Bible here, it says here, there's a, a couple of scriptures I wrote down here. I'll get to them in a second here. They didn't qualify for the list because they were not true servants of God. The other nations remained, the other tribes remained faithful, but Dan did not. So we see here that the tribes of Ephraim and Dan went off into idolatry, and therefore they are not included in this list. 
they were also so far north that they were north of where the uh, territory was that belonged to Israel, and they were absorbed into Assyria and the surrounding nations up there. Oh, that's good to know. I didn't know that. And the tribe disappeared. Was not the to go the and first gas, tribe also disappeared. Yeah, Bethel. Yeah, yeah, real old was in there. Things. Yeah, yeah. 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 wasn't Be wasn't Bethel in Ephraim? <laughs> I can't get my church. Yeah, but they were at uh, would have been La Laish sure. in the north. It had belonged to, uh, oh, what's that? It's a on the coast. Anyway. Yeah, Hosea so yes, chapter. the first tribe that completely disappeared. Yeah. See, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 17, the prophet wrote there, Israel, uh, sorry, Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. And I thought that's interesting. He also wrote this about Ephraim. He said, Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning among the tribes of Israel. I proclaim what is certain. Ephraim is oppressed, trampled in judgment, and intent upon pursuing idols. That's in Hosea chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. <laughs> so possibly because of their hot-headedness and their idol worship, Dan is left off the 144,000. Uh, the other tribes is not included in there. So Levi is included on the list. And there's a reason for that, because he's showing us that now Levi, the priestly tribe, is no longer required to be a priestly tribe. The real priest is about to come, the eternal priest, Jesus. And so Levi is now included with the tribes of Israel like an ordinary tribe because he's no longer required in priestly ministry. Jesus is going to be the high priest eternally. So uh, let's move on here, verses 9 to 12. Um, Don, what do you want to read 9 to 12? After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, filled with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and after the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Saying, Amen, blessing and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Now, here once again, we have the same thing we had in chapter uh, 5, where the, the, everyone is falling down before the throne in worship. So, in verse 9, we can see the redeemed multitudes of every nation in innumerable numbers. Dressed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, right? So when we think of white robes as Christians, we've always thought that white robes are right indications of righteousness, purity, and uh, victory. And that's exactly the message the Holy Spirit wants us to get here. That once we step on the shores of heaven, we will have perfect righteousness. We will have purity and we'll have eternal victory. See, victory, we're home at last. We're overcomers, more than overcomers. So white is the color of victory and purity. And in the third coming of Jesus, when he comes to put down all rule and authority and take control of the earth, he comes with a white robe that's been dipped in the blood of the oppressed. So there's a difference between righteousness and purity. And the difference is motive. So when we're talking about righteousness, we can be righteous without being pure. You realize that? We can go and do all kinds of wonderful things with the wrong motive. Purity is the thing that we need to develop in our lives because purity is the thing that will modify the motive for which we do things. The saints dressed in white represent the standard of God's redemption. There's and no one here who established his or her own identity or own salvation is there. Our outer garments, the Bible says, are like filthy rags. These are pure snow white garments. Do you remember the story of Jesus and the wedding guests when he said that the, the uh, uh, champion of the feast sent out invitations to everybody and they all came and gave them all different robes to wear. One guy got in there with the wrong clothing and they threw him out because he was not wearing the clothing that the, the owner of the feast or the, the leader of the feast had recommended or told them they had to wear. It's the same story here. There'll be nobody in that crowd that isn't wearing a bright white tunic uh, robe. So, we will see, as we will see the words, uh, they speak before the throne, and these things that they, they're speaking have a similar ring to them as they had in chapter 5. The verse, here's 
says that they were not only wearing white robes, but they also were carrying palm branches, or waving palm branches. Now, I thought that was kind of strange that the Holy Spirit would make a note of that, but everything in the Bible is there for a reason and a purpose. And so I started digging into palm trees and what value they had to ancient Israel and found all kinds of interesting things here which I've written down. First of all, the palm tree was the most useful of all trees to the people of Israel. It had no, almost no wasted parts. They used every part of the tree. The coarse fiber that was on the outside was used to make brooms and mats and baskets, which is a picture of how we work, right? The fine fiber was used, the fine fiber from the tree was used to make sewing thread. Uh, and their heaviest fiber was used to make strong ropes, which talks to us about security. Palm oils have been made into both butter and soap, which talks about cleanliness. Fine bowls, cooking utensils, even tools were made from coconut shells. Some palm wood does not easily rot and is especially good for making bolts, which is self-effort. The seeds of palms were boiled into medicinal drink or were dried and eaten like nuts, speaking about health. They were allowed, if they were allowed to dry for a long time, they became hard and transparent and made durable beads and trinkets, speaking about beauty. The palms' yellowish uh, white flowers were made into perfume, and women wore that speaks about odor, by the way. And then women wore the lovely waxy flowers as decorative headdress, which speaks about decoration. Now all of those things, when we talk about palm trees and, and palm, were given to God when they threw these palm trees down his feet. And it tells us that we, when we get to heaven, all of those self-effort things that we used to, to do are no longer valuable. What they're saying is, Lord, you are more valuable than all of these things that we've done. So whether it's the uh, attempt to work, whether it's our sense of security, whether it's our own cleanliness, whether it's our own self-effort, whether it's our own health, whether it's our own beauty, whether it's the way that we smell, or whether it's the way we try to decorate our lives, all of that is yielded and thrown down before the throne of God. Amen. So that's why palm trees are found in this particular passage. What it means is that the honor and praise for our salvation belongs to God, and He's the author of salvation. Amen. So strewing palm trees before the throne here is a symbol of giving up the worldly goods, both necessities and the luxuries that we enjoy down here. They're no longer of any value here. It is the acknowledgement that the toil of life is over. No more tedious work to do and God will supply our every need. Amen. It is recognition and surrender. Recognition of God as the eternal supplier and our surrender to allow Him to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of people who don't like to have anybody give them anything. I'm one of those guys. I like to be as independent as can be. People try to give me stuff. I'd rather do it for them than, than take it myself. And the same thing with taking over lunch. They try to buy me lunch. I can't handle it. It's just too much for me. I'll pay for it, but I don't want them to give it to me. And sometimes Christians were like that, aren't we? God wants to give us something. We fight to the bitter end. But well, Lord, I don't want that. But when we get to heaven, those barriers are going down. And we will once we get our eyes on Jesus, once we get our eyes on God, our hearts will be open to receive everything that He wants us to have. And all that. So every time we go for lunch for you, you're going to buy us lunch? Yeah, but just try and get me to take you for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with a pastor one time. Some of you might remember his pastor, Dave Webster. I took him for lunch one day, and we were sitting there and chatting after lunch, and he kept looking at me, looking at me, looking at me. I said, well, I guess I better go and get the check. He said, well, uh, he never said anything. I said, I'll buy you lunch. Oh, good, he said. I didn't want to do myself out of a blessing. So he was sitting there waiting for me to pick up that, that bill for him. You're watching us, Dave. I got you. He had a very good business at Dave Webster. Yeah, that's right. So these people who are, who are now worshiping the Lord are shouting salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And that seems to be a, a strange statement when you say salvation to our God, which is what the New King James says. What it means is that the praise and the honor for our salvation belongs to God, and He is the King of salvation. When He saves, He does it perfectly. There is no gaps in His salvation. Mm -hmm. When we give our hearts to Jesus, He has plans and contingencies for every need in our life, every fear, every worry, every sin, everything that could get into our lives. God has a contingency plan for us. It's the blood of Jesus. So, He 
he is the king of salvation. He owns what salvation is. Full salvation is not just forgiveness of sin. It's redemption in every area of our lives. So they're testifying here that they are also saved from Satan. <laughs> they're saved from the effects of the world. Amen. They're saved from hell. They're saved from the old law that used to be there. They're saved from God's wrath and also from death itself. So there's reason there for them to praise the Lord and say, Hallelujah, salvation from our God. He has done all of these things, and He's done them all well. The wonder of those facts brings them to their face before the throne of grace. When you look at all of the things that God has done, it should humble us. It should bring us to the point where we are absolutely enamored and so in love with God that we would never think of disobeying Him because He only has our good and best intents at our so, last week we were in chapter uh, 5, or two weeks ago in chapter 5, we looked at the beasts that were around the throne, and the saints that were there. And in this case, again, we have saints that are there, and I just wanted to talk about their posture a little bit here. They're standing before the throne when this starts, right? They stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, before the Creator, and the Mediator. There's an awesome picture here. Standing before pure love and holiness, and justified by grace. We can stand. And so often as Christians, we tend to think less of ourselves than we ought to. Mm -hmm. We are God's chosen people. His redeemed what are we? Royal priesthoods and holy nations. God is our enabler, and God has elevated us. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew a pastor who used to talk about God's redemptive lift, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. When in the presence of God, we're able to stand. We're, we're true human beings when we're in the presence of God and we're perfected, so we're elevated. And that's what the picture showing us here. They stand before the throne of God. It's a picture of who we are in God. And as Christians, we need to recognize that we have a position in Christ, that we are loved by God and we can stand boldly before the throne of grace. That's why Paul wrote, we can go boldly before the throne of grace because we are redeemed by God. We're his special creation. His perfect child, if you like. His pet lamb kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, in acts of religious worship, we come by to God, we need to see ourselves as part of and part of His redeemed creation. When we go to God, we don't go as beggars. We go as sons and daughters of God. Amen. It's like, I think I mentioned this before, that I went over to Don and Tyson's house and walked in their living room there without knocking and opening her fridge door. I'd soon be thrown out the door. Not the fridge door, out the back door. But you see, with God, when we're sons and daughters, He gives us that familiarity, that freedom. And He gives us the benefit of the doubt in every situation that we, we, we find ourselves in. So we stand before Him, a redeemed creation and a loved creation. I happen to be listening to K.P. Johan, Johan in here one day, his Gospel for Asia program, last Sunday when I was driving to, to church. He had me in tears. He was talking about the mighty love of God. <clears throat> And I thought, man, you know, I missed the mark here. Because we don't realize as Christians how very much God loves us. Mm -hmm. And how deep that love is. You know, we pass off Calvary like, oh, it's an established fact in my life. That's okay. But we realize that real blood was shed. Real flesh was shred. And this is the love of God to give up his only begotten son for someone who was at that time a stranger and wanted nothing to do with God. This is love that is indescribable. So we stand before him, we're a deep Christian. And the Bible says here, they cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Both the Father and the Son here are receiving praise. It was the Father who planned the salvation before the foundation of the world. It was the Son who purchased it and carried it out. So spontaneous praise that breaks forth not only before among the saints that are redeemed, but among the angels that are standing there as well. Everybody's getting excited when they start thinking about this. Amen. And we should be also, as Christians, getting excited when we sit down and really think about the wonderful things that God has accomplished in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we'll yet accomplish in our lives. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing. So they do this publicly with loud voices. So when we come into the house of God on a Sunday morning, if our hearts are full of excitement and joy, we could be loud in the presence of God and say, Hallelujah! Mm -hmm. I'm saved! I have a song called I'm Saved, and it's, it's an old one from John Starnes from years ago. And it's one of those bouncy songs that I'm saved, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb kind of thing. And I can't sing that thing without getting excited. I want to start dancing because I'm saved. Because, you see, 
God has saved my soul and God has saved your soul. And for that, there should be a joy that springs up within us every time we come into the presence of God. Amen. Because the love of God should flood our lives. So, we do it publicly with a loud voice. Now, some people are not really loud. But it sure would help, sure help us to speak audibly in the presence of God. Say, Lord, I love you. I praise you. Too often we'll tend to sit there and think, well, maybe somebody else prays better than I do, or maybe somebody else is louder than I am. I wouldn't worry about that at all. Get your two cents in before the throne of God so he can hear your voice. Don't worry, he knows your voice in spite of all of the others. There could be a thousand voices. God knows yours. <laughs> so, verses uh, 11 and 12 contain the, the song of the angels. So let's move on here and go from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Pastor Dean, you want to read that? Certainly. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robe? And whence have they come? And he said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, They are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their blood, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night within his temple. And he who sits upon the throne will shelter them with his presence. They will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Just before I get into 13, I wanted to deal with with verse 12 here. And what these angels have said. They say, Amen. When they amen, it means I agree with that. Or oh, let it be. Or we agree. And so what's happening here is they're offering sevenfold praise to God. If you look closely at that chapter, uh, he talks first of all about glory. The glory of his divine perfections. Who is the God of glory in all of his works of nature and provision and salvation. And he's blessed. He says, blessed here. Verse 12 says, uh, amen. Blessing. Mm-hmm. So he's blessed God, who's not only the blesser, he's blessed eternally. So blessing, the added of God, and glory, the perfection of his divine wisdom. Wisdom, his wisdom is to be seen in the works of all creation and in the government of the world and in the plan of redemption. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about God's wisdom here, these angels are saying, God has done all these things. Blesses he in wisdom. He's blessed in thanksgiving for all the mercies and favors, physical, spiritual, <coughs> eternal, enjoyed by all of his creation. He's to be praised for that. Giving thanks for the things that God has given us. Sometimes we, we think things get into our life and we think, oh, that's not very good. But we know from Scripture that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. So thanksgiving should be our first response to God in every situation. Then he goes on to say, and honor, which is due to him from all his creatures, because he is the creator of all. And from his children, because he is their father. And from his servants, because he is the master. So there's another aspect of praise there. They say we should give uh, praise to him for his power. He is the power which he has exerted in making everything out of nothing. In supporting the whole universe by his, the word of his power. And preserving his own people and all that are his Go through the great tribulation. 
situation and get these blessings. No, you're going up in the, in the rapture, I trust. Yes. I'm no judge of character, but I think you're on the right track. <laughs> so, he says here, God himself is going to shelter them and live among them. The old King James says he will live among them, he will dwell among them. And you dwell in the presence of God, you get all the blessing of God, like being over, covered with a cloak. His train just spills your life, all the victories, all the good accomplishments, all the power of God is going to be given to keep you in perfection, eternal. And then he says there's no hunger or thirst for anything. And you know, on this earth we hunger and thirst for so many things, don't we? The world is filled with, with unfulfilled thirst. People try all kinds of things to find satisfaction in life. They try drugs, they try illicit uh, sex, they try television shows, anything they can to pass the time and fill the gap. Some of them can't find success in marriage and they go from partner to partner. And sometimes there's five and six and seven marriages from one person. People thirst for reality. And they hunger for things that are not good for them most of the time. So what he's saying here is when we get to heaven, there'll be no more thirsting for those old things. There'll be no more hunger for the leeks and, and uh, fruits of Egypt, the old earth lifestyle that we had. That is going to pass away. So in heaven, our uh, outlook and our memory is going to be one that is cleansed from all of those old things that we used to desire that would get into our lives when we walked on this earth. That's a wonderful promise. Because at last, our souls and our hearts will be at eternal rest. We're no longer fighting the inward battle against the flesh and all those lures of the world because we now have no interest in them. And the reason we have no interest in them is because we live in the very presence of God. His holiness and His purity will fill our lives so completely that we have never again any desire for any of those things that we once wanted or thought were important. So, no oppressive sun and heat. And boy, I'm telling you, in this in nation today, there's oppression everywhere against the Christian people. People are constantly, there's a, one of the school board members is in trouble now for a remark he made about transgender. He, he made the mistake of saying he thought that transgender was a disease. <clears throat> and now the school board's after him and they're trying to discipline him. And I just read again about that lady that uh, refused to give out the marriage licenses for same-sex marriage. Uh, now they're investigating all the things that she did because she put a phrase in there they didn't like. She put in the phrase, according to law. And they don't like that. They want it undefiled like every other marriage license. Nothing to do with law. It has to do in this case because it's a special court decision for them to be able to be married. They put that right on their certificate and now there's a big cut off over that. So Christians, as we get closer to the rapture, will find themselves more and more under oppressive sun and heat. People, uh, people are going to be picking up Christian theology, disputing the facts of the Bible, trying to disprove everything they can. And all of those things are a tribulation for the Christian. And a battle to uh, to stand in the last day. No wonder Jesus said, "When I come, will I find any faith on the earth at all?" Amen. Because there's going to be such a tremendous outpouring of wickedness. The closer the enemy gets, or the Antichrist gets to power, the more unrest and foolishness you're going to see among mankind. Conversations about things that we never would have thought of. When I wrote this, I was thinking of about 30, 35 years ago. You never would have thought that there would be anything on the earth like we have today. You never would have thought that these rights would have been uh, approved and, and not only approved, but blessed by government. You know, times have changed. People have moved into a whole different dimension of understanding and morality. And God frowns on that because his word is true. And so he says, okay, if that's what you're going to do, then I'm going to set the judgment. And every one of these things that we see being legalized, liberalized, or held out that are of a sinful nature, God is going to increase the judgment that he's going to send on, these, on the earth. Now, just to wrap this up here, God himself will be the source of all light. All wisdom, all intelligence, all ability to see will come from God himself. And the Lamb himself shall feed them and lead them to fountains of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Fountains of water. It'll be pure, holy water. Water that gives life eternal. Water that never known pollution. Sometimes, you know, when I was younger, I used to get into the mountains, and some of these mountain streams are so, were so clear. 
You could literally dip your hands in there and drink that and never worry about getting anything. In fact, I can remember driving up to BC one time along the highway. They had a thing that came down the mountain side, a little stream. I would get my cup out there and fill it up and, and drive along and drinking pure water from the mountains. It was just, you couldn't taste any chlorine or anything in it. It was beautiful. I'll try and do that today. <laughs>
in that day, no one, you know, some said, you know, this. Remember there was a debate whether or not he was the king or maybe he was a prophet. Here, it is proclaimed before heaven that he is the king or the lamb of God. So that's the reason why the palm branches were placed within there. It was just something I noticed when we were when we were talking. I said, wow, Holy Spirit, I never saw that before. And that's kind of exciting, isn't it? Yeah. And then the last part that I want you to notice is 13 to verse number 17, where it talks about the tribulation saints. Now, remember back in number 5, they, they talked about the fact that said, how long are we going to have to put up with this, right? How long are we going to have to deal with this? Remember, they, they said, you know, when if what, you know when is this going to be over? And he said, when everyone has come into fruition. Isn't it interesting that just a chapter or so later we have that? In fact, the tribulation saints are not mentioned again until Revelation chapter twenty, verse number four, and then they are again brought forward, but then in that day, they will be given thrones. Okay? And that those thrones, the, the whole aspect of the tribulation saints are talked about after the Satan has been put into the abyss for a thousand years. So this is very significant because it says here, it says, they are the ones who, they, uh, looking back here, it just says, uh, the elders dressed, these are the ones who says, who have uh, clothed the white robes and have done, and they are the ones who have, who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And then, of course, it talks about the wonderful blessings that come. So this is the last time that the tribulation saints are actually mentioned until Revelation chapter 20. So I just wanted to point that out to you. Okay? So somewhere between Five, right through the seventh, there's a time period where all those who have gone in, because the Bible says they will not, until that number is fulfilled, here in Revelation chapter 7, we have them fulfilled. So I just wanted to point that out to you tonight as we head. Now, next time we gather together, we have the opening of the seventh seal. And the opening of the seventh seal then begins the trumpet judgments. And we'll be looking at four of the trumpet judgments. And they are very specific. And it was also interesting. It says in Revelation chapter 8, verse number 1, it says we have, we have a pause in Revelation chapter 7. Right, Gary? Yep. And then again in Revelation chapter 8, we have another pause. But the pause in Revelation chapter 8 is actually given a time frame. Okay, it's a time frame where there is no time frame here. So we will be looking at that next time when we gather together. So I just thought I'd bring these couple of things out for you to look at today.